Welcome to our weekly discussion with the people teaching the Pivoting Online course, or facilitating at least. I'm not sure how much teaching there's actually going on. Uh, so we've, uh, we're on to week three, where we're looking at fostering interaction and trying to discuss how to get students involved and engaged when you're teaching in these online settings. So why don't we start with just a quick set of reflections from uh, random people who are uh, facilitating the course. Justin, you, why don't you go? What's new? What's new with the course in general? It's been, it's been great to see um, the people that have been participating in the forums. Um, there have been some good conversations that have taken place there, and um, definitely would love to see if we can get some more people to, to chat, um, share their thoughts and different Perspectives. Um, like I said, just, just seeing some of the people in the introductory forms in particular, and we have a very wide group of people from, from very experienced teaching 10 years to, um, to you know, people that are just literally brand new and getting thrown into the ring. So um, I think I just want to encourage people that do have experience. I mean, we're, we're not, you know, we're not some of the big gate holders or like that. You, you have a lot of great experience and thought, thoughts that you can contribute to, uh, to, to the course as well. We would encourage you to do that. And if you want to use the Twitter hashtag, um, definitely do that. Um, if you want to put stuff in the forums and uh, answer uh, answer some posts that people have been having, um, you know, I think that uh, I think those are some some good opportunities uh, for for you to participate if you would like. Um, that's a great question about about MOOCs. Um, so so in the chat here is uh, so we have we actually have far over 1,100 people in the MOOC. Um, right now, and I think it's um, you know one of the things uh, that, that ultimately I think we want to be able to have in, in the course is um, when you have you know 1,600 plus you know people in here it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all super active. I know we've had courses that have been you know 20,000 plus, and and you have a certain group that are going to be very active in the forums and participating, coming to live sessions and things like that. But um, at the same time i mean you also have what the term would be lurkers people that are coming in and grabbing the things that they need and, and ultimately and we don't necessarily fully care i'm speaking for everybody here that that you know you're coming in and doing everything from beginning to end and going through and getting certificates and all that i mean if you're getting what you need from this course then i think we as the instructors are happy then you know we would love to be able to support you the best that we can so um <laughs> i'll let uh, someone else continue with that all right matt how about we throw it over to you um, how are things going? Oh, pretty good. Um, I was thinking this week, uh, someone from South Africa actually reached out asking if they could reuse the uh, course uh, template that I created at Canvas, and that was very encouraging. Uh, a lot of times when you do uh, open pedagogy, open resources and things like that, you kind of throw it out there and you see it bouncing around different places, but you don't really get much feedback. Uh, on those things, so actually hearing back from someone who's using it, and then asking if they could you know, remix and reshare it was very it was encouraging to hear. You just don't hear a lot about that, other than if people get mad about a blog post you made, they'll definitely let you know that. And you know, I've been start, starting too many fights on Twitter with too many uh, educational thought leaders, so uh, I, it was good to get away from that and get some good news. Right. Good. Yeah, no, I, you're, you're absolutely right. That's the thing when you do stuff online, you never know where people use it, hear about it, encounter it. Uh, the feedback doesn't often happen. So, so great to see that, uh, that you got a little bit of, a little bit of internet love. Tanya. Yeah, that was, um, I'm probably pronouncing her name wrong, but Al Rique, um, from Cape Town, South Africa. She also used um, some of uh, my content rubric as well and shared with me um, a quick guide to remote teaching that she put together. And so I think, uh, you know, it's great that people are creating resources and maybe potentially we could create a space where people can share some of the different things that they've created. And she covered, um, a different step similar to what we've con um, you know talked about in our live sessions during the first week as well as the organization overall organization sort of of this course so it's great to see that she was able to take that information right away and put it to use uh, for her campus so um, it's awesome to see so I think she's on the call well on this uh, session is what she said so our topic this week is fostering interaction. 
and if you talk about the community of inquiry model, which again, just to emphasize, it's one model among many. We've selected it because it's got a quick process to onboarding. It addresses cognitive presence, social presence, teaching presence. And uh, there was uh, briefly referenced in one of the citations this week, the sort of the Anderson uh, you know, equivalency theorem, which basically says, look, you've got these systems of interaction. If two of them are at a high enough level, you maybe don't need the third. So if you have a good enough degree of quality learning content and a good enough degree of, of uh, engagement between students, you've structured the course socially properly, then maybe the teacher isn't as important. Now, of course, that's not to say that the educator is not relevant, but what it is to say is there's a good degree of uh, support that we can get from one another when we're involved in a program or in a course as students and that that experience can be very positive for us without a heavy instructor presence. And intuitively that feels right to me, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on what some of your experiences are when you've been teaching online. Uh, does that resonate with you? Does that make sense or do you see it differently? I've, I've noticed that in some of my courses that I've been teaching online for a few years now, and I'm teaching for an instructional design and program with people who taught me and sometimes they've designed the course so well they hand it off to me as an adjunct and I start teaching and I'm wondering like well what do I do sometimes because they've they've designed the course so well that the students uh, interact with each other well in the forums and have plenty of projects to work on and stuff like that um, sometimes I feel like I'm interjecting myself in their learning process because it's been so well designed and I'm like well, okay, I'll just, you know, shut up and let you guys have at it. Sometimes I, I even log into our, our weekly or the kind of bi-weekly um, meetings like these in Zoom, and they're already just chatting away at, at what they, you know, what they need to do for the week. And I, I feel like I'm intruding, I'm like, well, sorry, I need to record this, you know. So uh, I, I, I see that, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for everyone because not all courses uh, – I think I think the topic would definitely make it different for different people, and I think people's experience would also, as far as like how long, how much experience they've had, and these, as well as your students, as what how much experience they've had in online learning. I can easily say that because the students I'm also getting have are you know like a year into doing online learning as well. So uh, if your students are new to it, I wouldn't necessarily just let this, the class go on its own like that without the teacher present. Um, thoughts from Justin or Tanya? Yeah, I was going to say, I, guess I think it kind of depends on, on the situation, the context for sure. I mean, I think if you're teaching, you know, graduate level courses, um, people that are in cohorts and things like that. I mean, some of these things will eventually lend themselves a little bit more to, to being able to, to be self, you know, directed or, or have some of these conversations. But yeah, if you're in a, in a freshman level course that has, 300 people in it you know might be a little bit more challenging to, to be able to do some of the things that you might have to be around more especially i mean people that are new to to like uh the kind of ecosystem too it's um i mean i, mean, I remember back in my <laughs> my first uh real experience i know someone asked this as, as one of the questions like you know sort of your your ed tech experience going forward and i remember going back and trying to put stuff into blackboard way 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 back when as a k-12 teacher and as an eighth grade uh, u.s history a teacher and um you know just trying to think about how on earth does the, the scaffold people you know into into that environment and i mean it's so a lot of it's just been experience over time and figuring out some of the things that, that work really well staying on top of the literature and, and seeing uh also you know what really supports some of the the things that i'm trying to do and and and, and uh you know i think again i think part of it is is that um this sort of this culture of you know hey we're in this together and and I'm, we're gonna try some different things and you know ultimately I'm here for you know student success and you know so however we design the course you know we're gonna we might try some things but ultimately as you as the instructor of course you know you have the ability to, to make tweaks as necessary to, to of course benefit the students so um, anyway just out there So what do you do with uh, so, so if, if you agree with uh, Anderson's equivalency theorem, which, like I said, it feels intuitively right, and, and Matt's experience of if it's well designed and there's a good degree of coordination between students and 
expertise on the part of the students. Like one thing I have found early on, especially when we first started running a number of these uh, online courses, I, I found it fascinating that students almost needed permission to do things rather than to do it intuitively. And uh, one way, and it was maybe a little bit of a cop-out, but in the first course that we ran in 2008, somebody would come by and said, well, you guys should have done this. And the answer was always, well, the benefit of an open course where students have agency is you go do it, right? If you think somebody should have created a module that explains this, have at her. And you know, that's where we really found the value of artifacts and artifact creation. And I, and I think when students create artifacts that reflect their understanding, they become teachers to others who are in the course as well. And we'd have people that would make a, a visualization of how the course components fit together. You know, what was the interaction space? What were the topics being discussed? And each time someone creates one of these artifacts, it serves as a teaching tool for other students who are also similarly grappling with a similar uh, stage in the course. What I've, but the skill sets need to be there first, and even not even skill sets. I think the mindset that says you own your learning experience. If you want something, you get it right. You you uh, engage with the material. You share your questions. You, uh, you you have to be willing to make yourself a bit vulnerable. I mean, I've heard statements that you know this concept that teaching is an act of courage, which I mean, I don't think it is at all. I think teaching is the most natural thing. For you know, when you're trying to learn in a formal way, that certainly is an act of, of vulnerability, right? Where you're asking a question that says, "I don't understand this. How do I do this?" And I think that's that has a huge uh, potential impact as well on learning. So, what have you found? And this is, I mean, this is for either of you three. But what have you found matters in terms of mindsets that enable you to participate well in interaction-based learning? <laughs> I gotta go on that time as we go. Okay, um, so so for me, um, I think that some of the stuff that we found um, in, in the MOOCs and, and in my uh, online history courses that I've taught at UTA is um, there's there's a bit of um, when we think about some of like these mindsets. Um, I think we found that that a lot of the students it's it's really hard for them to. As you said, it's like you almost have to ask for permission to go and, and, and do some things. And, and we've opened up the courses a lot. And again, when we're doing these sort of self map learning pathways types of courses, where you give the students a lot more agency, and it's almost like there's this natural hesitancy to, to jump into that space. It's like, holy cow, like I just would rather do, if, if I can give you a prescribed path through the course, and this is what I have to do to get from A to Z and get my grade that I want to get, you know, that's typically, I think, uh, what we, we tended to see, but it's like one of those things is like when they were willing to work more collaboratively with others and when they were willing to, you know, take a step out of their comfort zone or things that maybe that were a little unknown, that's where I think a lot of times you got that really, um, they, got, they got really excited about things and there's that fire and engagement that they were just really excited about. So again, I think I talked about this a few weeks ago, but, but some of the, the projects that I had where when I was teaching again in U.S. history, the Constitutional Convention, I had um, you know, the, the students working together on, on, on different ways that they could, you know, through a rubric, they had to address these certain things. But you know they had really exciting ways that they, they they put a lot of time and effort into it far beyond what they would have ever done if they were just studying for a test and it was something that they were excited about and wanted to share broadly and said yeah please use this as an example I had so much fun doing this and I remember this thing from 20 years ago that I did and I mean they just had a lot of good connections to it so um, I think that that's um, you know interacting with each other but also interacting with the course content as well. Well, um, I think there's just a lot of excitement that can come when you're trying to do something like that. I think that there are some challenges in doing that well um, when you're in the emergency phase like we are right now, but it's something to consider, you know, as you're going forward with your design and being willing to let go a little bit of perhaps the control and this and a set way through a course and allowing a little bit more agency and self-determination with that. Are there some settings where you don't want interaction? Like, are there some settings, course, curricular-wise, or others, or, or topics that you're addressing where you actually don't want to foster interaction, or where the interaction is actually more of a liability? Again, this is this is an open question. Yeah, I would say no. <laughs> um, I just think coming, you know, I'm 
from the communication field and being a social scientist and obviously ending up over here. I don't have the education um, background necessarily, although I've tried to read up on it. You know, we um, believe that meaning is always conveyed through communication and through transactional communication. So sharing information, providing feedback, being reflective on that, dealing with um, the context and how that impacts our exchanges and stuff are very important. And coming into teaching online, you know, lots of the courses that I teach, organizational communication, communication technology, organizational change, culture, all of those sorts of things, uh, you know, they're very situated around interactive communication, um, but also the outcome of the course is that people can analyze and be better communicators, whether it's working as teams or in examining organizations or so forth. And so for me, um, I, and I'm just noting down on post-its as we talk because my mind is mushed and I'll forget stuff, but there were sort of three keys that I always focused on in my teaching. And that was creating um, transactional communication where we can send and receive communication in asynchronous discussion forums, um, either as a large class or in small groups, working on developing social presence because communication from technology since the 70s has taught us that that's important so that we understand um, who we are as humans um, in these interactions. And then engagement coming down to the idea of academic and social involvement. So, the idea of engagement is that there has to be a not just the academic challenge piece, but a social involvement. And so I think creating and structuring interaction in an online course or in any course is really important. I think it needs to be far more strategic when we're talking about creating it online. And so, um, you know, and face to face, sometimes I think the scaffolding or the structuring of students learning or learning experiences might be just more um, tacit knowledge. It's really natural. So we don't necessarily have to think of it as much as we do when we are scaffolding um, interactive learning experiences online. And so, um, and I think that everyone has alluded to some of those. And some of you had questions about those in the discussion forums. It's not just saying like, hey, here's an asynchronous discussion forum or discussion board, go have a good time. Um, you know, I have to outline for my students, these are the learning objectives for this activity. These are um, the reading I want you to do before we have discussion. I want that, you know, I give them prompts. I ask them to bring in um, outside resources or personal experience about whatever we are processing that we read or watched a video on or so forth. So it sort of attaches it to um, real life situations. It gives students a chance to reflect, it gives me a chance to identify weaknesses in their learning. Like if they read something, let's say like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I feel like is in every discipline. And then when you start reading, students share a personal experience, they didn't understand a certain level. And you might not have known that face to face because online, I know that all 25 or 30 of my students are posting and responding so I can understand how they're processing their learning. When they're face-to-face, -face, you don't know. I mean, maybe when I teach my course, you know, you have the same three students who talk and answer every question, but you don't get to hear from all 25 of them. And I also provide examples of what I expect in discussions. I have a rubric I share with them. I give them, you know, examples of what critical analysis means. I give them sample discussion posts. So it sometimes can be a lot more work than obviously walking in, um, you know, at the top of the hour to your face-to-face -face class and just doing it on a roll. You know, you have to structure um, the discussion. And I'll um, share some resources later that I use to help with that. Um, but, and you want to make sure, I think what Matt was alluding to, that you're not, it's not a teacher-centered discussion. So one of my colleagues was having problems with this discussion and he said, hey, can you look at this? And he's like, uh, responding to every single student's post before there's even been a chance to be a discussion or people have gotten a chance to respond to each other. And that's what I call a teacher-centered online discussion. If you've responded to all 25, where are they supposed to go with that? So I usually like to give my students an opportunity for a few days to respond to each other. They have specific requirements in 
how and what they should do in responding to each other. It's not like, I agree, that's great. Like, I specifically want them to demonstrate they're able to critically analyze each other's ideas. And then you can jump in and play devil's advocate and lead them to additional research or, um, you know, examples of the activity. Um, I'll stop there, but also, you know, research shows that don't tip off into some Yeah, that's also a good question in the uh, comments, or a good, or good comment in the uh, chat there, excuse me, uh, about getting exhausting from reading every person's thought. Um, I think um, you really need to look at the, these discussions sometimes as, the, as an entire discussion in itself, not just each individual person, and look at where the discussion is flowing. Uh, like Tanya said, if you're replying to every one of the, the discussion posts right off the bat, I mean, First of all, you're going to tire yourself out. Uh, but second of all, you're also going to greatly influence the discussion to be just what you want to hear uh, because your responses are going to start influencing the other students and they're going to start, because they're going to want to, you know, get a good grade. They're going to want to please the instructor and so those, those kind of things. And so uh, if, you're, if you're looking at each individual student in the discussion and then replying to them, you start getting to this place where you're influencing it and you're biasing the discussion as well. So you want to uh, sometimes look at it as a discussion as a whole, and that's why some people will come in after there's been a Okay, overall, um, and other people will also do things like limit the number of the word count and add stuff to, to, to keep the reading. Uh, <laughs> low because there you have those, some students that like to uh, use a lot of that that's one thing people will say is, is is try to keep it under say 500 words you know so what would you do just to stretch oh sure, sorry ahead, George. Yeah, I was just reading this comment about assessing them and just a couple strategies that I use to manage my workload. First of all, I have a rubric, which I've shared previously, um, that actually has statements in the rubric that I could just paste into the comments. Um, for students to help them improve, it usually takes them a couple months. You sort of are, you have sort of this, this Discussion that's going to happen semester after semester and, and then I sort of have what I call the second round of questioning So eventually you're going to find out the students have very similar responses You can set up the discussion forum so they can't see each other's responses until they've posted and then I know I want the discussion to go somewhere deep and I know five second rounds of questioning or resources that I can share to help it get to that deeper place already set up in my mind um, and those are might be things that are in your mind that you haven't unpacked yet because you're used to face-to-face -face remembering them. But it's good to think about sort of what that um, second round could be. Um, and so, and the other thing um, with assessment, you know, having your rubric count very well um, and so forth. But I tend to be very difficult on assessing the first um, the first round of discussion so people know that this is not busy work. I really expect to see a demonstration that they're able to reflect on the reading and critically analyze each other's ideas about it. Um, and you'll find that they really uh, step up their game. I at one point had 14 discussion activities for every week that we didn't have an exam. <laughs> this was a long time ago, but um, when I was doing like chapter one is week one sort of thing. And uh, what I found out is that I started having seven modules um, and it temporarily helped me chunk up my course a lot better than the old way of us thinking when we, you know, when I was in grad school, that's how it went, you know. Each week was a different topic. Each week you got a chapter in undergrad or in grad school, you got five articles that you read. But you have to think differently about time online. And so I found like giving them a week to process content was great. Then the second week we actually discussed it. 
it reduced the number of discussions. It wasn't about breadth. It really became about depth and it richer, richer conversations. So sometimes you have to move out of your um, current sort of face-to-face -face time or temporal framework and think differently. You know, maybe it's the end of the semester. It's just a couple, a couple uh, modules, which they call them, which is a total education sort of term, I think. Um, but it's just sort of a time frame. So I did two week time frames instead of just every week trying to have reading, have a lecture, have a discussion, have, you know, that's just too much stuff. It's just like course and a half. So when you move online and asynchronously, time sort of changes a little bit for you. So um, just when we talk about overload for assessing, um, again, that's going back to the backwards design and rethinking it. Uh, you don't need to have an asynchronous discussion for every week and you don't need to have it on every chapter. So just a heads up to help with that. A quick question then, what would you say would be the maximum number of students in a discussion forum? Which I guess is getting a little bit to what Justin's asking here, but how many people can you manage in a threaded discussion online? I think that depends. Um, and so I think we talked about this a few weeks ago briefly. Um, but usually, if it's if the task is discussing content or something like that, um, I usually like to cap it around thirty. I've maybe gone up as high as fifty. Um, again, if you have a structured asynchronous discussion, um, I by no means would do would put you know four hundred students in one asynchronous discussion forum and make that happen, nor would I spend time reading you know an initial post plus two responses three times four hundred and I taught a face to face course of four hundred before at ASU so you know that's um, you know twelve hundred posts to read um, that doesn't work out very well. So I would break them into smaller groups. I would rethink assessment on something that can be manageable for your workload and scalable. And I think that goes back to what George was saying earlier is you should have richness. Um, we actually, I, I helped develop with my team um, a model for large enrollment classes online um, and where those considerations should be, you know, interactivity, um, versus the richness of the media. And so maybe, you know, an asynchronous discussion with, you know, 400 students obviously is not going to work. You need to figure out a different strategy to have that interactivity. Um, and maybe it's, um, you know, scaling it down. If you have TAs, oh, thankfully you have TAs. Um, you know, that's better than because you could have your TAs facilitate um, asynchronous discussions with 30 in them. You can also reduce your grading. My um, grading rubric, the one I shared with you all, is for upper level senior courses. Um, it's not for lower level undergraduate. The one for lower level undergraduate a lot of times is, you know, zero, one, two. They didn't do it, they did it and it was satisfactory, or they did it and was great. And you can find if you use a much smaller scale, um, that you can assess, um, you know, more responses or more students than you could using an, you know, a more detailed scale, but the outcomes are different. Again, why are you having an, an asynchronous discussion forum? There's lots of ways to build connection with your students. It doesn't have to be through an asynchronous discussion forum if you have 400 students. So, um, so just think about, you know, think about how you could build that. Maybe it's through um, you know, a semester long discussion, um, and that they're required to participate in X number to get the, you know, the points or something like that. Um, there's lots of different yes, ideas I've, there. I've done I'm that sorry, I'm just uh, dominating this conversation. Work. Yeah, I don't grade every single discussion post. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you have a 15 week course and you have 15 different discussions throughout the course on different topics, yeah, I don't, I don't grade all 15. That, so that's yeah, that's I have, um, yeah, I usually have, there's seven discussions and st students will get graded on five of them. Yeah. And <laughs> so um, that way you don't have to worry about like my internet was down. It's okay because you got two to miss, you know. So I found having, being flexible about those rules helped in abundant, like it limited my email. You weren't having people um, frantically email you about their technology failing or different things like that. So that really worked out. 
um, with larger groups, you know, um, breaking it down. And in that way, too, you can always use more um, interactive forms of media to help develop some of that richness and connection rather than using an asynchronous discussion forum. But I think it goes back to what um, you guys were saying is that it really depends on your course level. What are, um, you know, what are the objectives of the course? If this is, you know, Psych 101 and it's like memorize this book, um, you know, we actually moved a lot of our 100 level general education requirement courses to um, UPACE model, adaptive self-paced learning. And so in that way, the students, it's a competency um, or mastery based format. Um, and so the students can move through a 16 week course in, you know, in four weeks if they want to, because that's really what the purpose of that course is, is just to make sure that you have the conceptual foundation to move to higher level learning. So there's different ways you can, you know, you can design those courses. And if anybody wants any information, um, I can share the, the link with you on that data. And the data actually shows that the online self-paced course had um, statistically significant and randomized controlled trials, better outcomes than, you know, our large lectures. I taught a large lecture of 400 students with COM 101. That is not a good uh, learning experience for anyone. <laughs> so <laughs> let me just lecture 32 times. It's going to be great. So what would you say then, uh, so there's different sides. I know you can break into, you can assign students to smaller discussion groups. You don't have to have one mega discussion group the way we have it set up. Sometimes in a course you can, there's a number of approaches you can take to create smaller, more intimate discussion opportunities in threaded environments. What would you say needs to be done as a faculty member? If you have a course with a group of students where, and this is again, open question for all three of you, there's the, the discussions just not working and I'm sure you've had courses where that's been the case some courses it's almost immediate sort of like what Matt talked about you get started you have the right mix of students you have good topic areas that are readily amenable to to discussion and then in other settings you can have a group of students that just something's not clicking in terms of their desire to to engage so how do you foster interaction with reluctant students the way I've done that with mine is, is you know, those groups that seem like they're doing really well, I mean, I just kind of skim it and then move on to the next one and then try to find some that could maybe a little bit more instructor presence could help um, and try to encourage and spend a little bit more time in that. That's that's something I think that, that's worked for, for some of mine. There are some students that just disappear and yeah, they don't, they don't ever come in. And that's one of the reasons why I don't have super small groups too, because um, I think that sometimes um, there's some challenges around that, especially as you have attrition in a course and students start to drop out. So if you get too small of a, of a discussion group, that can be a problem. So, I, you know, I know Tanya mentioned earlier, like having smaller, if it's very focused project group type of thing, but if you're trying to have more of a bigger discussion, then you definitely want to um, have a little bit larger. And for me, I've typically stayed between the 15 and 30 level. It's worked well for, for what I've had for my purposes. People try not to get too lost in it, but um, anyway. Yeah. You know, Justin, you raise a good point, too, because if you're doing discussions in graduate courses, it's totally different. You could do a discussion in a graduate course with as small as four, four students, and four graduate students can discuss those articles in an asynchronous discussion forum with very little problems. If, you know, if it's an undergraduate course and you have a smaller number, uh, the students just uh, have problems getting started, and so sometimes you need to increase the um, number of students you need to create uh, increase. I try to make heterogeneous groups So there's some diversity there at least gender if you have any other demographic information about your students that can be very helpful um, Usually through intros or if you get SIS data um, You know, I like to put some of the what? Time zones has been something that has worked for me one time too. Oh, but that's that a good one too. Class that was national. Yeah. Yeah Because I like time well, they would have yeah. a little more synchronous kind of uh, component in particular. Right. And for my project teams, I do have them meet synchronously. Um, and then they have to submit sort of a reflection of what they um, did for that synchronous meeting. So time zone definitely matters. I was thinking too for my classes, sometimes I have like career people who are like in their 50s. And then I have traditional students. So sometimes if you can mix that up. Um, that really helps um, as well as is when you're composing these folks. Sorry, I just wanted to add that in. 
So Matt, can I, uh, so Tanya dropped a uh, provocative statement in the text area. <laughs> had a meeting yesterday that mainly consisted of us arguing. Um, I'd like to get a little more conflict in our discussion today. What's your reaction to Tanya's statement that creating and facilitating discussions is probably the hardest online teaching skill to develop? Do you agree? Did George get frozen out? Oh, there he is. Sorry. I That's Justin, you're muted. Oh, there's George. Ridiculous, ridiculous. We hear you now, George. There you go. So you we, we lost so you at the beginning of the. Uh, about to declare something, and then you cut off. <laughs> uh, okay. So my question was because we love conflict, <laughs> just throwing it at Matt. So Tanya said that creating and facilitating discussion is probably the hardest online teaching skill to develop. Do you agree, Matt? Um. Yes, I mean, just because I, I can get Stephen Dow pissed off doesn't mean I'm going to get everyone else pissed off at me. <laughs> no, uh, no, I I do agree that uh, um, I do agree with the statement that it is a very hard skill to develop, and I you know I also wanted to throw in there this this fact that we have a lot of students that are not participating in discussions because they don't feel safe or because they don't feel uh, like they have something to contribute, or they don't feel like that they um, uh, they can really share what they have to share without being attacked by someone else in the class and so on. And that sometimes is a bigger issue than we realize. And uh, for those students, I have no problem telling them that, uh, you know, okay, I understand that. If you just want to email me the answer to the discussion question, maybe even email me a response from the other student. And I'll grade that as if I would your discussion as well. Sometimes there, there's that flexibility issue, especially with a lot of students that are new to online learning and they're afraid of it now. I think we're gonna be seeing that a lot as well. Um, as far as uh, the the skill to teach, yeah, it's very it's very difficult uh, to teach that skill, and especially because um, uh, maybe this can be the controversial statement I can throw out there. A lot of faculty have control issues. They want to be the center and control of everything. And so they've got to read everything. They've got to reply to everything. Obviously, the people that have joined us here have stated in the, the chat that you don't like to re reply to everything. Um, but yes, it is true, George. I'm sorry. But, um, but and, and so you have to have every student responding. You have to have this. And especially when you go online, uh, your, how do I say this nicely? Your students have um, mastered the skill in face-to-face -face courses of sucking up to you and looking like they care face-to-face, -face, and then suddenly they can't pretend to be paying attention online, and it's obvious they're not really, you know, giving a, you know, bleep um, about what's going on when, you know, the, that involves answering a question. So uh, you're going to just have to, I think, let go of that control of that center and realize that their um, things are going to be a bit difficult and chaotic as well. I really don't know if I have where I'm going with that other than just to say the controversial thing that you got to let go of the control. And I was going to agree with that after that. that yes, I think that's one of the hardest parts is giving them control and especially over the amount of content to try. I think that's a lesson I haven't learned big, big time too was um, the amount of content doesn't obviously transfer to, so it's not just, you know, the, the ability to um, what you can control, what, what students can see or not see when they're taking a test and those sorts of things. But, but um, yeah, I think, I think that the, the content is, is a big one because I, and I see that currently at the university I'm working at where there are still a lot of people that are trying to do the exact same thing in the online space and not quite realizing some of the challenges and the cognitive load issues of moving into a different space with all the other stresses that are going on. And, and it's just, it's just different than trying to do things more synchronously and that kind of thing is, is, is a different mindset for sure than, than people that have been going in doing their, you know, their standard lectures that they've been doing for a while. I mean, I know I did a guest lecture, you know, you know, a number of semesters ago and person still had their typewritten notes and not to say that the information was, was bad, but that's obviously had been done on a typewriter in the eighties and they've gone in and done the exact same lecture every time. And it's just, there's just some challenges in, in moving different to this different environment like we are right now. And um, anyway, that was that. 
Well, I, I think the, we focused heavily on the discussion forums, the threaded discussions, because they are a key part of obviously any kind of online learning. Uh, they're a central form of interaction. Maybe we can spend, you know, we've got a few minutes left here, but maybe we can spend a little bit of time talking beyond synchronous or asynchronous discussions. There are things that you can do, for example, in a Zoom meeting or a synchronous uh, video session, prepared polls or uh, questions that you've identified in advance or having students lead and co-lead presentations so that uh, you're not solely lecturing. Students are involved in communicating and teaching and sharing to one another. So there's strategies that can be used in synchronous discussions. There are strategies that can be used in a range of other um, asynchronous mechanisms, such as encouraging students to engage in blogging, for example, or collaboration in the form of a wiki or you know, one item after another. But maybe if, as we sort of move toward a little bit of a wrap up, if I could hear from each of you on twofold, what are some guidelines for synchronous discussions that you think academics should be aware of or teachers should be aware of? And what are some alternative asynchronous interaction mechanisms that you can promote? Can you say that again? What is? Again? My, my, sorry, I've got a crap connection. I don't know what the deal is. No, I probably just can't hear <laughs> on that one. Two questions. One, yeah. how can you foster synchronous interaction, say, in a live call? Two, yeah. how can you use alternative environments to foster asynchronous interactions? I know for you, Tanya, you, you've written books on blogs and things of that nature and wikis and stuff. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's how would you do some promote interaction in both of those settings? Uh, well, I'll go first. I actually don't advocate for live sessions very much. Um, and so, although the technology has come a long ways, um, and I know that people have shared, you know, with the fact like, okay, well, I'll do a one hour live session or something like that. I think what we do here where we're having a conversation, um, that's very useful live. I think it's just based on the media characteristics as a communication technology scholar, Having a synchronous meeting with a large group, it just doesn't uh, work the way I think that you would like it to work. I think that um, this is useful for developing um, a bit of social presence. People know who I am, you know, um, they get a little bit of who I am as a human being or as a scholar and those sorts of things. Um, but I really don't advocate too much for synchronous technology because of the risk and so forth. Um, in most contexts. I do encourage, as I was mentioning in the conversation with Justin, that my small group project teams um, definitely should be connecting with each other through a synchronous technology of their choice. There are so many free options out there these days, and um, the Wisconsin system has options um, for folks because we have a common systems technology um, offerings. Uh, and so in that way, I think um, it's great for smaller groups. Um, and and one of the ways that I foster students having a connection with each other um, and opportunities for peer learning is through small groups. And so I'm a little biased here, some of you know, because I studied um, groups and virtual teams and virtual teams versus face-to-face -face teams. Um, and I've studied decision-making and brainstorming activities and all of those sorts of fun things in um, comparison modes. And then when I moved to learning um, a long time ago, went and um, heard some people speak at faculty college when I first had come to the university. And it just really touched me about hearing about how groups were used at UC Berkeley to help increase the um, performance of underrepresented minority students in math. Um, it was something like they used to have a 96% failure rate. Um, and when they started using these small group teams, that students were, and being an uh, being a low-income first-generation college student meant a lot to me, um, and it's probably why I ended up um, deserting my psychology degree and moving on to graduate studies in communication because I loved the pedagogy and the way they approached teaching so much because a lot of it was team-based or group-based. But for underrepresented students, we don't have a mom or dad or a brother or sister to go to when we have questions about college. We don't. Um, we're trying to figure it out on our own. Maybe we have a roommate or something like that. Um, and if you're low income first generation, like there's not even extended family um, or anyone in your neighborhood maybe that knows. 
So by putting students in groups, you're allowing them to build a learning community, to build a connection um, with fellow students that may have answers, not only to help them with the learning of the course, but help them with learning outside of the course that underrepresented students don't necessarily have. So I think by creating these groups, um, and we also know, right, that peers learn better from peers than they do us, actually. Um, that peer learning is, is far greater. So I think any opportunities that you can do peer learning um, and peer instruction that you can put students in groups that's going to meet their needs, not only academically, but also um, other support needs they might have just for um, you know, their persistence through college, I'm going to advocate for those all day long. So um, that's my bias there. Um, and that's why I guess I was sort of pushing for thinking about the last um, eight weeks of the term for us, oh, we're down to seven weeks, you know, thinking about how could you make this about group-based learning instead of how can we make this about X number of students learning X number of chapters just for me through a synchronous classroom. So that's just sort of why I was pushing for folks to think more about the, the group stuff. And um, Justin posted online a book by Michelson and can't remember the middle officer and Fink. Um, Dee Fink used to run the Teaching and Learning Center in Oklahoma. Um, they have a really great um, book, team-based learning for any discipline. They even have examples from biology. The first two chapters I think everyone should read. The rest of the book is case studies. But, um, you know, based on my knowing the last probably 70 years of small group research. The book is um, pretty um, well informed. So it's good stuff. Anyways, I will get off my soapbox about group projects and group communication and uh, pass the mic. <laughs> Justin, over to you, just to, as we move towards wrapping up quickly here, what's your thoughts? Yeah, for, for me, I'm, I'm big about, if I do the thing that's synchronous, I don't like to just be the only person talking the entire time. I like to give up control and, and allow this the students or if I'm doing it in another type of webinar session to have other people participate in it um, throughout the process, not just like a QA and a at the end sort of thing. Um, that's, that's something that's something that I, I personal more of a preference than anything, but I found that he's trying to, I don't, I don't want to sit there and um, lecture at people. Um, I don't find that's a very effective strategy at all. And um, the last uh, thing was about the more or sort of asynchronous other ways of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something I've tried in all my courses were having students use uh, open blogs, um, having students uh, create wikis, things like that all together. Um, if I, sometimes um, there's a level of scaffolding that has to take place with that. And with, with scaffolding, I mean um, supporting certain parts of a process that, um, so in this case, let's say blogs. Um, if you don't know any HTML, or if you don't know how to grab a URL, or you don't know how to, you, start to, you might have to think about some of those things in advance and, and get some of those things into your course to be able to support your students, to be able to use some of these external tools. Um, kind of the same thing with wikis. I had students completely erasing the other people's work when it was a collaborative space, things like that. So um, you'll need to make sure to just be thinking about um, some of the possible contingencies that, 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 that are in play there. But um, I found that they've been very um, rich um, when they've uh, tended to do that kind of work. And Matt, take her home. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to agree with everyone else in that I don't necessarily look at synchronous sessions to be a good way to communicate content or to teach lessons. They can be, it can be a good uh, tool for uh, creating some teacher presence, some social presence, some immediacy. Uh, as long as it's not overdone or uh, you know also create an avenue for showing some care as well again it's not overdone and intrusive so uh, that's what i would mainly use those for also there are you know certain disciplines where uh, the synchronous can be good for say a demonstration of a specific uh, skill uh, you know especially now that we're online if you want to demonstrate a lab or something uh, with uh, your teacher uh, like and as long as you're not overdoing that or seeing having students that they're staring at you for an hour while you're fiddling with uh, you know biology tools or engineering tools or whatever. Uh, for asynchronous, uh, one thing that I like to do to kind of think outside the discussion forum box is to do a, a pass the baton kind of exercise to where if students are in their groups, you'll have a the prompt that you usually do for discussion in the discussion board. But then you have someone that starts off 
uh, creating a blog post about that question. And then the next person in that group will then take a quote from that person's blog and they will blog about that. What they will do is they will expand upon or they'll disagree with or whatever that. And then the next person takes a quote from that person's blog and then expands upon it and thinks about it some more. And then sometimes I really want to get, uh, uh, you know, a bit uh, wild. I'll have it to where one person from one group will start the, pa the process for another group. And then that group will start passing the baton with the responses. And again, it, it gets them interacting with each other in different ways that aren't necessarily always everyone answers the discussion post, but it gets them thinking a little bit deeper about the discussion topic. So I also don't want those topics to be something that is just a set answer. It's something that they're reflecting on application or one of those kind of things as well. All right, great. Well, thanks all for the conversation here. I think certainly in digital environments, and this is sort of clearly communicated, the, the ability to interact with others is one of the key affordances. And it is a power shift, like Matt noted earlier. You do lose some of your control and influence. You make it available to a network effect, and it does require different techniques and methods to be successful. Just like it can take a career to learn how to be a good lecturer or a good classroom instructor, uh, it's a craft in its own, line, own right to learn how to facilitate asynchronous and synchronous discussions well. Any final thoughts from anyone before we wrap up? All right. Well, on that note, thanks everybody for joining and I'm ending the recording.